Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Collier. I am an epileptologist in Grand Junction, Colorado, and I wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to present with the Epilepsy Foundation of Colorado and Wyoming at the Epilepsy Connect Symposium. It is an honor to have an opportunity to speak about a topic where that I am particularly passionate about. Uh, it is my life's work helping patients with epilepsy. And I am also trained in um, integrative medicine. And so I take a little bit more of an um, integrative approach to epilepsy, if you will, in that uh, the primary treatment for epilepsy is medication. However, what I tell patients is working on some other factors can potentially help medications work better. Uh, and that's what I've seen clinically and anecdotally. And I just want to share that with you today. And the way we're going to approach it today is talking about um, balancing the medical and emotional aspects of a new epilepsy diagnosis. And um, this kind of hits close to home for me because I just had a very close personal friend who was uh, seen in the emergency department last night with new onset seizures. And, um, you know, one in 26, you just never know when it's going to happen and who it's going to happen to. The only thing that's consistent in epilepsy are its inconsistencies. For those of you who are out there, um, who have a new diagnosis of epilepsy, I hope you find that these slides are helpful and informative in terms of, you know, kind of directing you through the overwhelming seemingly um, diagnosis of epilepsy. Uh, and for those of you who aren't necessarily new to epilepsy, who that you have a known diagnosis of epilepsy, I do find that these slides can be helpful for you as well because um, what I have seen is, you know, it takes sometimes getting the information one, two, three, four times, sometimes hearing it from a different person, sometimes hearing it um, in a different angle. So we're going to all just kind of approach this with a beginner's mind, looking at uh, the, a new epilepsy diagnosis and kind of what that, what that means. So first of all, what is epilepsy? Epilepsy is the fourth most common neurologic disorder after migraine, stroke, and Alzheimer's disease. It is a disorder involving repeated seizures, and it can be lifelong chronic illness, and most people, uh, fortunately, most people are able to manage their seizures with treatment. So epilepsy is among the most serious neurologic conditions, affecting one in 26 people. It has no geographic, social, or racial boundaries. It affects people of all ages. Uh, it is frequently associated with other comorbidities, not just seizures, and it has a high rate of premature death compared to the general population. And when I say most serious diagnosis, you know, we're going to take a deep dive into that and, and really what that means. And there's never really a good time to have a seizure. And again, as I said, the only thing that's consistent in epilepsy are its inconsistencies. And that's where it becomes very challenging and very scary for someone who has a proxismal disorder of consciousness. So there's no single cause of epilepsy. Anything that disrupts the normal pattern of electrical activity in the brain, in many cases, the cause is unknown. That's also called idiopathic. That doesn't mean that your doctor is an idiot. It's Greek for idios, which means genetic, I think. Um, but it just means that a lot of times we cannot find the cause. Uh, it's, it can be at such a microscopic neurotransmitter level. You can have just an abnormal cluster of neurons somewhere in the brain that fires a little more excited, a little faster than the other neurons in the brain. And that's really kind of the way to think of it. And sometimes that cannot be detected uh, <clears throat> on EEG. Uh, sometimes it can be detected grossly, uh, especially with surface EEG uh, early on in the diagnosis. Uh, so it can be due to an injury to the brain, such as oxygen deprivation, which we also call hypoxia, stroke, traumatic brain injury, genetics can play a role. So what is a seizure? It is a transient occurrence of signs and or symptoms due to abnormal or excessive synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. The brain is the source of seizures. I remember having a patient ask me one time if they could have seizures in their spine. And to the best of our knowledge, at least at this point, um, we believe that the brain is the source of seizures. That's why we do EEG electrodes on the brain. And um, basically, again, it's an abnormal firing of neurons in the brain. And anything that can lower seizure threshold uh, can trigger a seizure. So that's why I tell people, if you have a brain, you can have a seizure. There'll be some people I will never have to take care of, um, and I won't name any names, but uh, I see some people, I'm like, I will never have to be their doctor. I'm kidding. But uh, if you have a brain, you can have a seizure, and that's the most important thing. And I see myself for patients who've had a seizure, 
I see myself as a, a preventative epileptologist, so secondary prevention. And for those of us who are walking around who've never had a seizure, I like to think of primary prevention because we all could have a seizure, those of us with a brain. And so doing things to skew the odds in your favor of not having a seizure can be very helpful for not just people with epilepsy, but for all of us. So what is the difference between epilepsy and seizures? I've had patients say to me that they don't have epilepsy, that they just have seizures. And the point is um, epilepsy is characterized by recurring seizures. So epilepsy is just a symptom. And I remember when I was first told that as a resident, I kind of had to really wrap my head around that. And I kind of see epilepsy as like a check engine light, seizures as a check engine light, telling you that something's going on in the body and you have to pay attention to what that is. Uh, classically, two unprovoked seizures means a person has epilepsy. A seizure is a brief temporary disturbance in the, the electrical activity of the brain. We've already kind of hammered that home. And then essentially seizures are a symptom of epilepsy. So the question is seizure or epilepsy. So epilepsy is a disorder of the brain characterized by an enduring predisposition to generate epileptic seizures and by the neurobiologic, cognitive, psychological, and social consequences of this condition. The definition of epilepsy requires the occurrence of at least one seizure, and that's important. So interestingly, and we'll talk a little bit about EEG electroencephalography um, in a moment, but uh, back when EEG was first invented, uh, they thought this is going to be a diagnostic test for everything. And they actually um, were using it as a screening tool for pilots in the Dutch Air Force. And they were hooking up people to EEG just as part of like, I don't know, like could this guy have a seizure while flying kind of thing. And they found, I believe it was something like 3% of the um, soldiers actually had abnormalities on their EEG without ever having had a seizure. And I actually do get probably once or twice, sometimes three times a year, for some reason, someone got an EEG. Uh, you know, it's not like something you do at the fair or the, you know, health fair for fun, but, but for, you know, some, some biofeedback devices, that type of thing, use EEG. And someone will come in because they had an abnormal EEG during biofeedback or something like that. And you know, they're terrified that they have epilepsy, but the most important thing to remember is if they've never had a seizure, they haven't got any spells, and we'll talk a little bit about what spells are, uh, I can't give them a diagnosis of epilepsy just based upon the EEG, because epilepsy is truly, at the end of the day, a clinical diagnosis. So this was a paper, or I guess a report that came out in 2012. It's, I think it's like 284 pages. It's available for free online as a PDF for your rating leisure. Uh, and it's called Epilepsy Across the Spectrum. It's an amazing tome of information uh, from the Institute of Medicine on um, what epilepsy is. And it's a spectrum disorder. You can see on one end, someone who is, has an epileptic encephalopathy, which means that they don't really ever stop seizing, don't really ever come out of it. They can't really think clearly. They're intellectually delayed, that type of thing. And then on the other hand, you could have someone like Chief Justice John Roberts, who has had seizures in the past. So you, you can see like um, a spectrum of people and that's what I see. You meet one person with epilepsy, you've met one person with epilepsy and I don't ever tend to generalize because I'm always humbled. In, in epilepsy, it is one of the most humbling fields in medicine. And so I stay open and I stay humble at all times. And epilepsy across the spectrum is a very good um, report and it uh, promotes greater public awareness and understanding of epilepsy. So one thing to understand is that epilepsy is costly. However, unfortunately in medicine, we are penny wise and pound foolish on so many things. And the indirect and direct cost of epilepsy in the United States is estimated to be around 15.5 billion annually. Despite this number, the uh, National Institutes of Health spends $30 billion on medical research and dates, uh, de dedicates one half of 1% to epilepsy. So looking here, historically, epilepsy has been neglected, feared, misunderstood. A veil of secrecy surrounding the disease has resulted in myths, superstitions, and general lack of knowledge. Uh, this has impeded scientific process towards finding answers to one of the most, one of the oldest known, they talk about it in the Bible, one of the oldest known and most prevalent neurologic diseases, leaving treatment and research efforts in the dark ages. Truly. Okay, really, I'll I'll step off my soapbox. But honestly, I think for me, 
one of the most frustrating parts as an epilepsy specialist sitting across from human beings with epilepsy on a daily basis is seeing how little research is dedicated to epilepsy. So look at how much research is dedicated to Alzheimer's disease. Who gets Alzheimer's, generally speaking, right? People with epilepsy tend to be young people who are struck down usually in the prime of their life. For me as an adult epileptologist on a daily basis, I have to sit across from adults who have new onset seizures in their 20s, 30s, 40s, who are still high functioning, who are still working. And yet look at the amount of money that is spent. And that's not to say that money shouldn't be spent on Alzheimer's, but I do find it interesting on the skew in priorities. Now, I, I'm, I'll, I'll again, sorry, it's, I'm a bit passionate about it. So <laughs> anyway, who gets epilepsy? Um, approximately 5 to 10% of every 1,000 people. And please don't make me start doing math because like, I mean, this may not add up. But I know it's one in 26, more commonly diagnosed in children. And I'm not going to say it's more common in children. What I'm going to say it's more commonly diagnosed in children. And that's because people are looking for it. Um, there is an increased rate of epilepsy in the elderly. And given that the population is aging, right, the baby boomer population, I mean, you know, we are having, we're like in a deluge of like older people. And after the age of 60, there's a 3% per decade chance of developing epilepsy. So I do imagine we are gonna to start to see it more commonly diagnosed in older patients. So the problem is it manifests differently in older people and it's frequently mistaken for things like dementia or that type of thing. And there's not a low threshold, no pun intended, there's not a threat, low threshold for, um, checking an EEG or, or looking for seizures in older patients. So um, this is Neil Young. He's kind of been in the press lately, um, but he, uh, he has epilepsy and he says, epilepsy taught me that we're not in control of ourselves. Amen to that. It's an illusion, isn't it? So every four minutes, someone is diagnosed with epilepsy in the United States from the Epilepsy Awareness Network. So again, do the math at the end of this talk, a number of people will have been diagnosed with epilepsy. Epidemiology of epilepsy. Approximately 10% of the population will experience a seizure in their lifetime. 200,000 people are diagnosed with epilepsy annually. Approximately 3 million people in the US have epilepsy. The lifetime risk is 1.6 to the age of 50 and 3% at the age of 80. One in 26, uh, the American, uh, the Epilepsy Foundation has a whole program dedicated to that. It's more common in males and females. It affects 65 million people worldwide and 80% of those are in developing countries, when I was a resident, oh no, excuse me, I was a medical student, one of my mentors, he had an epilepsy clinic in South America, and it was dedicated primarily to people who had neurocystocytosis, which is um, a pork tapeworm that goes up into the brain and forms these calcified cysts, and it is actually one of the most common causes of seizures in Latin America, and he had a whole clinic dedicated to it. So approximately 60,000 Coloradans are living with epilepsy. So epilepsy and mortality. And I don't want this to scare anyone, but I do want people to be aware of the fact that epilepsy does double the risk of dying. And uh, the annual uh, rate is about 50,000 deaths per year occur um, due to epilepsy related causes. And that's actually more people dying annually from epilepsy than breast cancer. And unfortunately, Everyone's talking about breast cancer, but no one's talking about epilepsy and mortality. And I think we need to really shift that awareness. Everybody knows when Breast Cancer Awareness Month is. You see pink ribbons all over for October, and that's great, and it should be that way. But we need to have more purple ribbons in November, right? And we need to, you know, have knowledge and awareness. You know, I mean, that's all like the, the funny part. Like I get on the plane in October and like the pilots are wearing like pink ties and like all these things. And yet, you know, November, it's like crickets. Come on, like, come on, put on some purple ties, you know, in, uh, in November. Anyway, uh, so chronic uncontrolled epilepsy increased mortality risk. Sorry, I don't mean to laugh. I'm just, I just, to me, I guess I'm just so passionate about this. I, I don't mean to have my passion come out so intensely. Uh, I just think that it's stunning to me when you step back and you look at these numbers and you go, come on, let's raise awareness. Let's raise funding. Let's you know increase knowledge about this um, and make it uh, a priority. It just stuns me. Anyway, causes of death in epilepsy. Unfortunately, um, I have had patients who have experienced these. Uh, being in Colorado, you do have to be aware of risk of sitting on a chairlift uh, and having a seizure while on the chairlift. That has happened to 
uh, a couple of my patients. I do have a couple of patients that like to ski passionately and they, they actually wear a chest harness and they actually clip it in when they um, get on the chairlift. That is something to really think about. Uh, and it is something that is a risk. And especially for as someone who has lost uh, patients to some of the um, more perilous aspects of epilepsy, I, I do like to make people aware, again, not to be scared. I don't want anyone to feel like they have to lock themselves in a total line room and never come out. I do want people to live their lives. I had one patient who said, I have epilepsy, but epilepsy doesn't have me. And I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's it right there. That's the spirit. But we do have to always acknowledge and recognize and respect the disease as well. Sudep, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. Uh, one of the um, uh, football players for the Denver Broncos, we suspect that that was a potential cause for his um, demise. And uh, one of the Disney actors as well uh, had, uh, we believe that was the cause. And I have had patients that have that. And again, so it's a, about a one in 1,000 risk, but the most important thing about SUDEP is one of the best things you can do to protect yourself from having SUDEP is control your seizures, taking your medication, working on avoiding seizure triggers, that type of thing. Classifying epilepsy. So this is something that's interesting. Like, I mean, I, I sit across from patients all day long. Like this morning, I had a patient who's had seizures since the age of five, and she said, I have petite mal seizures. And then I had a patient who's in her 70s yesterday, and she's had seizures since the 1960s, literally. And um, she's like, I have petite mal seizures. And I, each of them, I have to say, let's take a step back and pretend like the word petite mal doesn't exist. And would you just tell me what you mean when you say that? Because the terminology has changed. And the patient yesterday, her petite mal was uh, actually myoclonus. And um, for this patient, her petite mole were actually what were classically called complex partial seizures uh, when I had them elaborate. But technically, a quote unquote petite mole seizure, <laughs> there's supposed to be an unquote there, but it's only quote. Uh, technically, a petite mole seizure is one where, um, particularly in children, um, they just kind of stare off in the space for a brief moment and then they actually come back and resume exactly what they're doing. And that's a classic absence uh, seizure, and it's very common in children. You can actually bring one out in the exam room by having the child blow on a uh, a wind a little a pinwheel, not a windmill. I don't keep a windmill in my exam room. So the new basic classification, the ILAE, the International League Against Epilepsy, which is the world's main scientific body devoted to the study of epilepsy, uh, revised seizure classification in 2017, just to keep everyone confused. So basically the new basic classification, uh, the, <laughs> I'm sorry, they call it the simplified version, but it really does make things more complex when you're talking to patients. Um, it's based on three features. And I mean, honestly, it's like, it's elegant in its intention. Let's put it that way. So it's based on where seizures begin in the brain, the level of awareness during a seizure and other features of seizures. So this is, um, you know, again, for your reading leisure. I don't expect anyone to memorize this. And, but when you're when you're getting a report or you know patients have access to medical records these days and you know you see something in in like your your clinic note from your doctor or you see something you, you might see some of this terminology and so it's kind of good to just see it and to know it and so focal onset um, used to be called complex partial uh, with uh, the impaired awareness so focal onset impaired awareness motor onset versus non-motor onset and then focal to bilateral tonic comment. So generalized um, onset uh, is, you know, the classic quote unquote grain mall. And so tonic is basically when a person tenses up and clonic is when they shake up. And then the non-motor is the absence. And the generalized means that when you do an EEG on this person while they're having a seizure, it looks as though the seizure starts from all over the brain. And that's kind of the thought about generalized onset versus focal onset. Focal again means it's coming from one area of the brain, generalized means it's coming from all of the brain. So ictal semiology. I'll go into ictal in just a moment. But semiology means, hey, what does the seizure look like? Uh, generalized seizure involves the whole brain and loss of consciousness. Absence, brief loss of consciousness, motor, tonic, clonic with contraction, rhythmic jerking of muscles, focal seizures, uh, the patient may turn their head to the left or the right. They may flex or extend one arm. Um, and actually, interestingly, the symptoms may affect the, 
they may relate to the part of the brain affected. So I had one patient where the area of his seizure focus was his language center. So eloquent cortex, and it was his area of speech. That was literally where his seizure was coming from. And he knew when the seizure was coming, he would basically just completely have speech arrest, just, boom, just stop talking. And he would get so annoyed. He couldn't talk and it would last like maybe like at ma maximum two minutes. And then, you know, then he could start talking and then the seizure would stop. It was so focal. It just stayed there. It never secondarily generalized. It never did anything like that. And um, we got him on some medication. And, you know, the great part is that most seizures do respond to medication and, and fortunately his did they responded beautifully and you know he stopped having these episodes of speech arrest but it was truly unfortunately um fascinating in that it was just one area of the brain and you could tell what area of the brain it was because it was his language center so how is epilepsy diagnosed <clears throat> so uh it's truly at the end of the day a clinical diagnosis regardless of what the eeg shows um now, there are some caveats and some other things about that that I really won't delve into, but I just have to keep in the back of my mind. But at the end of the day, I sit across from a patient and I hear their story. That's why I call myself a spell doctor, not one that casts spells, but one that listens for spells. And, you know, it's a, it's a clinical diagnosis. The family members can tell you, and I'm going to promise you something. It's way scarier seeing someone have a seizure than it is for the person who's having the seizure. The person who's having the seizure is kind of like blissfully unaware, not blissful perhaps, but nonetheless, completely unaware. The person who's watching the seizure, especially if it's a grand mal type of seizure, they're, or, you know, generalized, I don't, you know, you know what I mean. Um, back in the old terminology, the new terminology, I was using the old, forgive me. But if it's a grand mal type of seizure, basically a generalized non-chronic seizure, then basically um, the family members watching their loved one seize, it looks as though they're getting assaulted from the inside out and they feel so helpless. And, you know, a lot of times I'll say, um, how long does the seizure last? And, you know, for them, it lasts for the lifetime. It doesn't feel like it's ever going to stop. But, you know, I, for those who can take a moment, take a deep breath, look at their watch and be like, and make sure the other person's safe who's seizing, be like, okay, this lasted 45 seconds, this lasted a minute really and truly most seizures stop fairly shortly so if someone's telling me that they're having like a you know 45 minute seizure i do start to wonder if that's actually an epileptic seizure or something else and we'll go into that in just a moment as well but um <clears throat> really and truly um at the end of the day family members provide the best history and actually i have had some family members bring in videos of the seizure because technically uh salim bin bin Baris has like a whole lecture on this he tells people you have half of an epilepsy monitoring unit on your person all the time, it's called your cell phone. And as opposed to like making videos of cats, make a video of your family member who's having a seizure provided that they're safe and you're safe and all those types of things, if it can be done, it can actually be extremely helpful for the clinician who's trying to help you. I've had some patients come into the epilepsy monitoring unit, I've had, taken away their medications and monitored them and they don't have a seizure and I can't see what's going on. And then they come in at their next appointment, their family member is like, I've got a video, and they show me the video, and I see, and there's certain things that you see when you watch an epileptic seizure, and I'm like, oh, okay, now we know exactly where your seizures are coming from, what type of seizure it is, and let's get you on appropriate therapy, that type of thing. So it's very important. So we can do an EEG, um, electroencephalogram, MRI brain. There's no real laboratory testing that's diagnostic of um, epilepsy. You know, there's some things that are banded about like a prolactin level being elevated, that type of thing. But the reality is at the end of the day, there's not real one lab you can hang your hat on and say, hey, yeah, with this lab being positive, we know this is an epileptic seizure. However, metabolic disturbances like, you know, hyponatremia, which is a low sodium or a hyper or hypoglycemia, which is blood glucose derangements, those can potentially lower a seizure threshold. So it's always important as you're working through was this a provoked seizure versus an unprovoked seizure it's very important you know because if, if the patient's having provoked seizures go upstream of the problem right remove the provoking event as opposed to just trying to suppress the seizure so eeg electroencephalogram invented by hans berger in the 1920s uh it's actually a really incredible story i won't go into it 
story I have time for. I have time. So basically, he was in the German military um, doing training in World War I. Um, he, he was actually uh, Jewish, and he was um, on a horse doing um, some type of military training. Uh, I think it was actually before World War I actually broke out. And he was like on his horse, and he got thrown from his horse and um, into the front of a cannon cart. Uh, you know, I mean, I have a visual for what this all looks like, but anyway, so the cannon cart like almost runs over him and he sees his life flash before his eyes and he thinks he's gonna die. They stop the cannon cart in time and he's like, ah, whoa. Well, at the same time, his sister like gets this sense that her brother's in distress and she sends like a telegram or something that says, hey, are you okay? And he gets it later and he's like, how did you know that I almost died? And so he actually invented EEG in the beginning to look for um, any indication of telepathy. So that's actually how EEG was initially invented. And the first EEG that was ever done was actually done on his son, um, uh, who I believe was actually killed at a military checkpoint um, by the Nazis. But, uh, and then Hans Berger ultimately killed himself. So it's a very, very fascinating story. But the first EEG was nine Hertz alpha and it was Hans Berger's son. Uh, he is a giant in the eyes of epileptologists, but interestingly in Germany, I am not so famous, uh, but he was heralded as, as just a genius um, by inventing electroencephalography. So basically it's just these electrodes that stick on your head and um, it's not needles or anything like that. It's just um, held on with usually a conductive gel, unless we're having to do it for an extended period of time, then we use a glue. And it detects electrical activity in the brain. And uh, basically it demonstrates changes in brainwave activity. And there's certain patterns that we look for on EEG that can tell us you know, various things. And um, I don't expect anyone to be a professional electroencephalographer, but we, we look for symmetry, we look for abnormalities, we look for amplitude, those types of things. And it really helps us kind of build an overall gestalt for um, what's going on with someone's brain. If someone continues to have seizures, their EEG is negative, then the next step is for them to come into an epilepsy monitoring unit. And, uh, and basically for patients to continue to have them, we, we monitor them in an epilepsy monitoring unit. Here at St. Mary's, where I am in Grand Junction, look at that view. Um, we uh, have a four bed EMU and we're very proud of it. But unfortunately, in the unprecedented time of in medicine with COVID, oh my God, I cannot wait until I can stop saying that. We have actually been shut down for about two years. Every time we would try to reopen, uh, because we are in a very rural geographic area and because of the challenges of transferring patients and receiving patients, our hospital was, I had one patient who um, he came in to see me and he was actually in the emergency department for three days. Like that's actually where he ended up staying in the hospital for his stroke. And so, um, you know, we were just in a crisis. And so unfortunately I had to keep my epilepsy monitoring unit um, closed. Uh, also, I didn't want to bring in patients with epilepsy, you know, into a hospital that was completely full and riddled with COVID. We are hoping that we have turned the corner, God willing, and we will be able to get our epilepsy monitoring unit back up and running. And we're very proud of it. And we are a National Association of Epilepsy Center, recognized level three epilepsy center. Um, Academic centers such as the University of Colorado, Denver are a level four epilepsy center. And what that means is they do epilepsy surgery. So the patient is monitored in the epilepsy monitoring unit. This is our monitoring station. The patients are watched 24 seven and uh, with video monitoring. And sometimes we have to take away medications to try and capture these events and see exactly where they're coming from. All right, so how do you recognize a seizure disorder? Are there periods of blackout or confused memory, paroxysmal fainting spells, episodic staring, eye rolling. I had one patient who worked at Walmart as a cashier and she almost lost her job because all of the customers were telling her manager that she was rolling her eyes at them during checkout. <laughs> and the reality was she wasn't like, you know, rolling her eyes. She was having little like um, small, like eye, eye myoclonus type of seizures. And we got her, her, we got those under control and she got to keep her job. Uh, but it was just interesting how you know, that was mistaken for a behavior when it actually was uh, an ICTL phenomenon. And I don't think I, I went into what ICTL was. I thought I had a slide on it. But when I say the word ICTL, like uh, ICTUS, ICTL Latin uh, is blow. 
and the seizure is thought to be a blow to the head. So when we talk about ictal, we're talking about the seizure. So the seizure is considered an ictal phenomenon. Um, after the seizure is considered post-ictal, and then um, inter-ictal is you've had one seizure, you have epilepsy, and you're risk for having another seizure. And that period between the first seizure and the imminent possible next seizure is considered the inter-ictal period. And for patients with epilepsy, our goal is to make that inter-ictal period like imminent, like forever. But anyway, that's where ictal comes from. And so you may hear, um, you might get asked by your doctor, you know, was there a post ictal state. And so after the blow, like after the seizure, was there a time where you were confused, couldn't respond, couldn't answer a name, those types of things. Some people have something called post ictal psychosis, where they actually um, kind of seemingly go mad and lose their mind. And, you know, I've had, I've had some patients tasered by police um, in a post ictal psychosis. We've had, you know, patients on the floor uh, that we, it, it, it can be very hard to protect um, people if they go into like a post psychosis type of state uh, because people can become very violent, very dangerous, and, and not be aware of what they're doing at all. So it's something to be aware of. Um, episodes of blinking, chewing, fidgeting purposely with hands, that's called automatisms. Also waking up with disheveled cheeks, bloody tongue, or a loss of bladder, that can be suggestive of possible nocturnal seizures. There are also uh, mimickers of seizures. So there's syncope. So, which is a uh, fainting. So syncope is like fainting, passing out with post-syncopal convulsions. That's very, very frequently mistaken for epilepsy. And the treatment is different. Sleep disorders, stroke, migraine, intoxication, proxismal movement disorders, psychological disorders, transient global amnesia, and panic disorders. So I'll touch just a bit on what are psychological disorders that look like seizures. And it's called functional neurologic disorders, functional seizures. I don't like the word um, psychogenic non-epileptic seizure. Here's a quote from Celine and Marius. Uh, it's a real condition that arises in response to real stresses. These seizures are not consciously produced and they are not the patient's fault. So I think that's always the biggest challenge with helping people understand functional neurologic disorders. It's not that doctors are telling you that it's in your head, but that we are trying to explain that there are no objective findings. And the problem is I have a lot of patients who will have both epileptic and non-epileptic seizures. Epileptic seizures respond to medication, non-epileptic seizures do not. And so I have a lot of patients that will have a mixed clinical picture and it becomes very, very challenging to treat. But this is a book called The Body Keeps a Score. It's by Bissell van der Kolk. He's a psychiatrist. He actually does trauma-informed yoga. He's up at uh, UMass or somewhere on the East Coast. And um, it's a really powerful book to read about trauma and, and how you kind of store issues in your tissues and how that can manifest in different ways, particularly seizures. So another thing that my patients might have, um, this is where we go back to smells, are auras. So there can be like olfactory auras where you can smell things. I've often wondered why it's always foul smells. Like none of my patients have ever complained about smelling like oatmeal cookies baking or anything like that. Like it's always like, I had one patient when we monitor in the epilepsy monitoring unit, we could tell that she was about to have her seizure because the first thing she would do is go, Ew, and then like go into her seizure and she was smelling burning tires. That was what she would smell. So burning rubber, um, some patients have said it's like a burning wires or like a computer, like if a computer is like um, overheating type of smell, that type of thing. I've had patients call the fire department and have them like come out and like investigate the house to see if like there was something going on there. Deja vu, which means you've seen it before. I had one patient who he, both he and his mother had um, epilepsy. And it's a particular type of focal epilepsy and you get deja vu, it tends to, we tend to think it's coming from the temporal region, which is your area of memory. And he and his mother both were like certain they could see into the future. They just knew it. I had one patient who would like, when he was a kid, he actually wouldn't be worried when he would go in to take a test because he was like sure he had taken the test before. And then jamais vu, which uh, jamais is uh, never uh, seen. So it's, you go into a place that should be familiar to you and you can't see it. Auditory changes, that comes from a very uh, special place, Heschel's gyrus. Um, nausea, epigastric rising sensation, feelings of impending fear, if it's in the amygdala. Numbness feeling on one side of the body, again, if that's a focal type of seizure coming from a certain area. Confusion can be a generalized type of thing, and then visual changes uh, it can come from the occipital cortex. First aid. Oh, I've, I've had so many patients tell me that somebody stuck something in their mouth for the love of God. 
Like, I just wish that we could somehow get that one to just go away. I don't, like I had a patient who told me even a paramedic stuck a wallet in his mouth one time and you can't swallow your tongue. It's stuck to your mouth. You can't swallow it. Um, I had one patient who was in like jail and um, he was having a seizure and one of the guards like tried to stick his fingers in his mouth to keep him from swallowing his tongue and he bit the guard's fingers and he ended up having an extension of his jail time because he assaulted a guard. It was like not his fault whatsoever and seems so unfair. Um, so, you know, again, uh, don't restrain the patient. Don't stick anything down their throat or in their mouth. Um, check for an ID bracelet, just stay calm. That's the most important thing. There's almost kind of like a medieval response to like someone having a seizure. Just remember that this person isn't aware. Or they're probably gonna be scared when they come to you. Um, stay with them. It's a human being having a medical issue or a medical crisis and, and not to worry uh, about like, you know, not to freak out. That's, I think that's, stay calm. That's the most important thing. Oh, here it is. I like knew I had it somewhere in my slides. I just put it in the wrong place. So yeah, we talked about it still. So how do you treat epilepsy? Medications. Uh, I have patients who come in all the time who don't want to treat their seizures with medications. And trust me, I'm an integrated medicine doctor. Like if, if there was like a 100% integrative approach that you could take to treat epilepsy, I'd be like, sweet, let's do it. You know, and I'm in Colorado. If we treated epilepsy, I wouldn't have a job. You know, I mean, you hear about it all the time. Like, well, so-and-so started taking whatever, whatever, and their seizures completely stopped. Guess what? Chances are they just got really lucky. They weren't going to have another seizure in the first place. Um, but for the most part, if you have a paroxysmal disorder of consciousness, aka epilepsy, your best treatment as an adult is going to be medication. And it's not like I, you know, love pushing pills on people. It's just that that's the God's truth. It is a very, very challenging and scary disease to treat. And we have very limited options outside of medication. That doesn't mean you can't take a non-pharmacologic approach. And we'll go into that in a moment. It just means that for the most part, you have to raise your seizure threshold. You have to keep those neurons from being a little more excited. Now, there are children who have certain types of epilepsy, especially juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. About 30% of children will actually grow out of it. So you can revisit and readdress that as people uh, grow up. But if someone's continuing had the seizures in childhood and they continue having seizures into their 20s, chances are that is going to persist through life. Other options include surgery, neurostimulation devices. We now have three FDA approved devices, BNS, RNS, and DBS, dietary factors, and lifestyle modifications. So again, we talked a little bit about neuromodulation, brain surgery, diet, and medications. Treatment goals, right? Stop seizures. Nobody wants to have seizures. Here's the thing though. 60% um, of patients will not take their medications as prescribed because guess what? We're human. It's hard to remember to take a drug twice a day. And unfortunately, most of our seizure medications, just because of the half-life and the pharmacokinetics, they are required to be taken twice a day. Even a lot of our extended release formulations still require twice a day dosing. And so the most common cause of breakthrough seizures in a patient with known epilepsy is missing their medication, just saying. So I tell patients, it's like, you can remember to walk out of the house without putting your you know, baseball hat on, but you better walk out of the house making sure you took your medication. It's the most important thing. So uh, things to consider, you know, what type of seizure do you have? Is this patient of childbearing age? Do they have a genetic predisposition to develop a severe uh, reaction to certain types of medications, carbamazepine and Han Chinese? Uh, those types of things, lifestyle, right? Um, some medications can cause some pretty significant uh, cognitive changes, and you may not want that if you're in engineering school, um, patient age, side effects, cardiac issues, all those things. So here's the frustrating part for my patients with anti-epileptic medication. Anti-epileptic medications do have side effects, and it's the God's truth. The great part is that most people will be able to get used to medications over time. It is going to make you feel different. Chocolate makes me feel different. Like, I mean, sugar makes me feel like if I eat a like caffeine, you know, which I've always had some of today, um, anything that you take can make you feel different. And seizure medications, until we get like nanotechnology, which I think would be amazing in epilepsy, 
seizure medications don't just work at the seizure focus, right? They don't just work on the seizure neurons. They actually work in all of the neurons in the brain. And, and so because of that, it's a central nervous system depressant. Really and truly, that's what seizure medications are working to do. They're working to raise your seizure threshold by reducing the excitability of neurotransmitters in the brain. And they do that by operating at sodium channels. Uh, they do that by operating um, at various uh, excitatory neurotransmitters. They do that by operating at uh, chloride channels, uh, uh, calcium channels, all those types of things. Sometimes they're carbonic and hydrase inhibitors. I mean, there's like over 35 different anti-epileptic medications to choose from. They have, um, some of them have very similar mechanisms of action, some of them have very unique mechanisms of action, but at the end of the day, the biggest side effect, the most common side effect does tend to be drowsiness. That's why I do kind of a start low, go slow approach. Uh, it's kind of like the seven doors that you wouldn't want to hang out with, drowsy, dopey, dizzy, grumpy, you know, those types of things. But for most patients, they do start to tolerate the medication over time. And in fact, I have had a lot of patients tell me that they feel better on the medications because they're not seizing anymore. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of an old graph, but I like it. Um, but this is kind of like the chronology of anti-epileptic drug development. We're now in third generation anti-epileptic medication territory. But seizure medication options um, kind of came around with bromide salts um, in the 1860s. I think it was like, well, are we going to use saltpeter or bromide? And saltpeter they ended up using for ammunition in the war, and bromide they ended up using in epilepsy. Uh, as a resident and as a medical student, you would hear like rumors, especially when I was in uh, medical school in San Antonio because we were close to Mexico, I would hear rumors of people who were still being uh, treated with bromide for their epilepsy. And I was like, where do you get that? Like the hot tub store? But fortunately, I don't think I've seen anyone treated with bromide now for like 10 years or so, but uh, it was still used for a while. Phenobarbital, I actually still have the occasional patient who comes to see me who is on phenobarbital. It is used very commonly in pediatrics, but they tend to try to stop that medication before the age of three. Um, Phenobarbital just celebrated its 100th birthday um, in 2018. Happy birthday, Phenobarbital. Uh, Phenotoy was in the 1930s, and then we were off to the races from there. Uh, we do have our newer generation drugs, and I do need to get a different graph, but the ones that I could find online were all like copyrighted or something, so I just, here you are uh, for now. So factors that influence response to therapy. Again, medication adherence. That is the most important thing. Adequate dose. So adequately chosen, adequately dosed medication. And then making sure you're treating the right type of epilepsy. And then once again, as we talked about non-epileptic seizures, are you actually treating on, are you actually treating epileptic seizures? Or you know, could this be syncope or some other proxies in the history? Okay. Epilepsy and drug resistance. So this is the Quan and Brody study. It's kind of like a famous study. It's over 20 years old now, and it's been replicated multiple times with very similar outcomes. So you have a 50-50 chance of seizure freedom with the first drug. And in the studies where they replicated it, like that kind of varied a little bit, but ultimately the outcome was the same. About one third of patients with epilepsy will continue to have seizures despite being on medication. So the drug-resistant epilepsy definition from the ILAE is too appropriately chosen, too appropriately dosed medications, and you continue to have seizures when you have drug-resistant epilepsy and other options need to be considered such as epilepsy surgery and neuromodulation devices. So that's it. Um, you continue to have seizures through medication. You know, so one third of patients could have drug resistant epilepsy. So the good news is 65% of patients will be seizure free on medication. That is epileptic. So this is the most catastrophic thing that can happen with epilepsy. It has about a 30% um, increased risk of mortality. And um, again, the most common cause of status epilepticus is in a patient with a known history of epilepsy who um, has missed their medications. The good news is that is also the easiest type of status epilepticus to treat, but it's typically defined as a seizure lasting more than 30 minutes. <sighs> I remember reading that when I was a resident and being like, so we're going to sit here when someone sees for 30 minutes? So what the studies have shown is the longer that someone goes on having a seizure, the higher likelihood it is that that seizure is not going to stop. So really and truly we go in if a seizure lasts longer than five minutes, um, start considering uh, an algorithm. And there's actually two really good algorithms, one I use for up to date and one from the American Epilepsy Society that you can follow uh, if someone is in status epilepticus. And there, 
there are some cases of super refractory status epileptic kids, and a lot of those tend to be um, cases of like uh, autoimmune or uh, some kind of antibody mediated type of status epileptic kids. But that's like, I'm getting into the weeds there. But it's recommended that we should treat a seizure lasting more than five minutes, which is considered a prolonged seizure. So I don't know, I, I, I could go on, but basically the theory is like the longer a seizure goes on, it actually alters what types of receptors are on the surface of the cell and makes them less responsive to uh, medications that could suppress the seizure. Rescue medications for patients and families. So up until about two years ago now, uh, we had one FDA approved drug, it was rectal diastat. And <laughs> I'm going to go about intranasal because like nobody, um, even like children who are intellectually delayed or uh, they know it's not cool to get your pants pulled down in the middle of the store and have something stuck up your bum. I've had patients who were like, I would rather sneeze. <laughs> and I know it's not funny, but it's, you know, you, you, we, so we had to explore other options. We were doing these like in pencils. I would like get this like automatizer with a syringe and they would get this like 3%, uh, like it had a pH of three out of van that the EMS would use in their, um, you know, in their emergency kits. Um, and it was horrible. Like our, our options were really, really limited. For what we could offer patients. And I was like, why don't we have an EpiPen? You know, I was like, why don't we have something in epilepsy? And fortunately, finally, um, we've got intranasal diazepam and intranasal midazolam that can be used uh, for patients who are having cluster seizures or prolonged seizures. Uh, and so I do recommend, I'm stunned. I had a patient this morning who is in her 20s and she's had seizures since the age of five and nobody had ever done a seizure action plan nor had they done a, um, a rescue medication. So rescue medications are important. I didn't put seizure action plan in this slide, but the Epilepsy Foundation has an excellent seizure action plan link on their website. Uh, I do recommend that you look at that and then talk to your neurologist or epileptologist about getting a rescue medication. And, and, and here in the Mountain West, and I've been in the Mountain West for over a decade now, whether it was Utah, Montana, or Colorado, and it's important, right? I mean, getting EMS up over a pass during a snowstorm, you're in rural areas, all of my patients like to go hunting and camping and, you know, be out in the middle of nowhere because that's why we're here. And so, um, you know, it's important to have, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So again, we talked about status epilepticus kind of conferring a high risk of morbidity mortality. Again, um, the most common Thing that contributes to breakthrough seizures is medication adherence. Also keep in mind that like sleep deprivation, stress uh, can be seizure triggers, illness, fevers, substance abuse. Uh, so, you know, the American Epilepsy Society uh, does recognize that people want to live their lives and have an occasional glass of wine with dinner. And there's no real data saying that, you know, for a person with epilepsy that uh, occasionally enjoying uh, an adult beverage would not would would hurt you. However, there's a line there that's there's like multiple caveats to that. You're taking medications that could potentially interact with alcohol. Uh, the other thing about drinking alcohol is alcohol is also a CNS depression. So you constantly are having this up and down of neurotransmitters. The way I see it is, you know, you've got a disorder of neurotransmitters in your brain and anything that you do could potentially disrupt that. And for patients with epilepsy, I kind of think of their brain as like a gunslinger at high noon just saying, give me a reason to fire. So it's not a major food group. You know, there's very nice mocktails that people can make. There's some actually really good mocktails online. There's not really a reason to drink alcohol if you find that it is something that you have had a seizure with. And it's not a judgment. MD doesn't mean medical dictator. I'm not here to tell someone what to do with their life. But I can tell you, like, if you have epilepsy, really and truly, your goal in life is to raise your seizure threshold as high as possible. And alcohol just doesn't skew odds in your favor. That's all I can say. So seizures can be prevented by looking at, again, seizure triggers. How do we try to trigger a seizure when we monitor someone in the epilepsy monitoring unit? We sleep deprive them. So sleep deprivation, stress, all of those types of things. You know, sometimes people have seizures regardless of what they do. But again, it is one of those things where if you can look at some, take a step back and be like, oh yeah, I was sleep deprived that day, or oh yeah, I was stressed that day. 
and start to try to work on those factors. It, and again, just kind of skewing the odds in your favor. Jeff embarks on his mission to treat the whole person. The wellness wheel, my favorite thing. I love this so much. Number one, it's so pretty. Um, and number two, it's so right. I did a whole talk on this last year and I was so excited about it and I love it so much. It may still be available online somewhere. And uh, if you go on the Epilepsy Foundation website, there's a link down there. You can find the Wellness Institute and click on each one of these little paddles and see how you can actually address each of these factors to help with epilepsy. So dietary factors. So the ketogenic diet um, is one of the oldest known treatments uh, for epilepsy treatment. And interestingly, it was kind of heralded as the gold standard for treatment until 1930 and what came along in 1930 is dilantin. And so it kind of got pushed aside until the 1990s and that's a very young looking rare oak street who is the um, spokesperson for the Charlie Foundation. And Charlie Abrams' dad uh, is a director and he um, wanted people to know that his son Charlie um, actually did very well with the ketogenic diet. I think you know he had actually had multiple surgeries on five medications at the age of 19 months. They went to um, Baltimore up to Hopkins which was still doing the ketogenic diet. They found a nurse who was trained in it and um, Charlie stopped seizing after about a week. And uh, I think at the age of five, he was able to stop uh, a lot of his medications. And this is Charlie graduating from high school, I believe. So the foundation, Charlie Foundation is very helpful. It actually has some really good videos about the ketogenic diet, what that is. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it's a very specialized high fat diet. It doesn't just have to be like, you know, whipped cream on top of bacon. There's some very good keto options, but I will tell you as an epileptologist, uh, when the Kardashian keto came out, I wanted to scream because like, it's not, there's a difference between like, you know, your neighbor, you know, eating some keto junk cookies or something like that and an actual medical keto diet. And I do recommend if you are gonna explore dietary therapy with any type of seriousness that you work with a nutrition professional. Um, Hopkins actually has an amazing ketogenic uh, diet program. I think it's run by Mackenzie Savinka, and uh, she's got uh, some very good information on the Hopkins website about it. Interestingly, everyone always thinks of Johns Hopkins as kind of like the pioneer with the ketogenic diet, but in reality, it was the Mayo Clinic. I have the original paper from 1910. Well, I mean, I guess in reality, it was the Bible, but yeah, so they talked about the ketogenic diet and fasting in the Bible, but uh, let's kind of like move up a little bit. We'll say, say 1910 Mayo Clinic, which is, I guess, the first like quote unquote evidence-based uh, ketogenic diet. Modified Atkins, um, very similar, but more sustainable. Um, and there's actually some really good papers. Elizabeth Teal has a good paper talking about how the modified Atkins is more sustainable, easier to adhere to, and not nearly as restrictive. Low glycemic index diet, LGI. Once again, um, less structured, and there's a whole video on the Charlie Foundation about the differences and the nuances between these two. And then there's MCC. This is Matthew's friend, so that's Matthew there. Um, he's it's the British version of the Charlie Foundation, and they have a whole program as well. A uh, very great resource. I can't recommend it highly enough. And the modified, um, uh, or excuse me, medium chain triglyceride diet is MCT is also an option. So it is important. Epilepsy is a mean disease. And I say it's mean because like you take these medications, the newer medications aren't as known for causing osteoporosis and bone loss, but that could also be because they haven't been around as long as dilantin. Dilantin is kind of one of the more famous medications that can cause osteoporosis. Uh, and um, so it is something that you have to keep, keep in mind. You have a disorder that causes you to seize and drop to the floor, and then you're on medications that can cause you to have osteoporosis, and it puts you at higher risk for you know, bone breakage. So I do recommend, you know, DEXA scan, which is, you know, if you've been on anti-epileptic medication for over five years, they do recommend that you have a DEXA scan, which is looking at your bone density and consider calcium and vitamin D supplementation. Exercise. So um, when you exercise, your brain releases BDNF, brain derived natriuretic factor, and um, it is an important thing to uh, help you. And I don't know why. Okay, that one's good. Okay, yes. So um, depression. So depression and epilepsy, it's a bi-directional 
relationship. I call it depilepsy. It's my own word. I haven't patented it or anything. But uh, basically, I I get frustrated because people are like epilepsy comorbidities, epilepsy comorbidities. But the reality is, it's kind of part of the disease process. Mm -hmm. And 50% uh, of patients with epilepsy will suffer from depression. And interestingly, if you have depression, you have a 30% increased risk of developing epilepsy. Complementary and alternative medicine, I love this. You've got to be kidding me, your back still hurts. Uh, so basically non-pharmacologic interventions. The most important thing, if you are going to look into non-pharmacologic uh, therapies that include supplementation, making sure you let your doctor know 52% of patients with epilepsy use supplementation. And it's, it's important to know because we don't want any medications uh, interfere or any supplements in interfering with how your medications are metabolized. Right, so I've had some patients who uh, they're doing well and they start taking some sort of supplement and they start having breakthrough seizures. And that's because the supplements cause their liver enzymes to increase um, the metabolism of their anti-epileptic medication. So it is just something to um, uh, keep in mind. And then in terms of cannabinoids, it's almost like the new version of peer pressure. Every single one of my patients, the moment they're diagnosed with epilepsy, someone comes up to them and they're like, Hey, have you tried cannabis? Did you try CBD? Da, 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 da. And it's like this, this very interesting peer pressure. There's no strong evidence. I mean, here's the caveat here. There's no strong evidence for like dropping, you know, a 10 milligram dose of CBD oil under your tongue. Is it possibly placebo? Yes. Is there power in placebo? Yes. But what I can tell you is in the clinical trials with Epidiolex, uh, which is our FDA approved um, CBD that we use, you know, we're using 10 milligrams per kilogram or, you know, something along those or, you know, more than that actually. But the reality is you're using um, much, much higher doses than like just a drop under the tongue of something that you got at a flea market. Avoiding epileptic triggers. So again, sleep deprivation, encourage dietary habits, avoiding excess alcohol consumption. For some people, it's avoiding alcohol consumption altogether. I do encourage smoking cessation because I feel like you're throwing gasoline on this fire. If you continue to smoke, you're depriving your brain of oxygen, you're increasing your, you're increasing inflammation. I, you know, it's the right thing to do. Uh, illicit drug use, flashing lights, stress, medication adherence. I love this. Stop smoking, quit drinking, eat less, exercise more. Are you some kind of health nut? I've often wondered why I'm the nut when it comes to that type of thing. There are also self-management programs, which are wonderful. So other chronic diseases, particularly cardiac disease and diabetes, have self-management tools. And the evidence does support using self-management tools. And those self-management tools can actually help with medication adherence. You also feel like you're a part of a group. And, and so there are some um, resources. You can't see them very well there. But um, definitely, uh, some uh, self-management tools are available through the Epilepsy Foundation. I can't recommend the Epilepsy Foundation of Colorado. And Wyoming enough. I have to get used to saying Colorado and Wyoming because um, we've got Wyoming now as part of our, our network. And I think that's wonderful. But uh, I just, in my mind, it's hard to not say Epilepsy Foundation of Colorado, so forgive me. But, uh, you know, there are so many organizations out there. We even, for us on the Western Slope, we have a Western Slope um, Facebook group. And it's really great, you know, I mean, because what happens if someone gets a diagnosis of epilepsy, they go out to Dr. Google and Dr. Google is a dangerous place. You're going to start hearing the horror stories. And, you know, I have to, I, have, I can't tell you how often I have to do damage control for social media. And it breaks my heart because patients become terrified to try anything. And I'm like, look, you know, these medications, whatever we have to offer you has been FDA approved. It is the gold standard of care. It is better than the horrors of like having a seizure and getting hurt and ending up in a burn unit or something like that. So if you can go to good, um, well-vetted resources, that's going to be way better for you. Project Uplift is a wonderful resource um, available through the Epilepsy Foundation. And basically, it's using mindfulness and positive thinking to cope with negative moods and associated with epilepsy. And uh, they have at least a few programs a year. You can find out when the next one is starting by going to the Epilepsy Foundation's website. And it's all online and telephone based. So for those of you who aren't able to drive um, or shouldn't be driving because you're continuing to have seizures or for whatever reason, then uh, the Project Uplift is great because you don't actually have to go anywhere. 
So International Epilepsy Day actually fell on February 14th this year. It's uh, the second Monday of every February. It happens every year. And so this year it was on Valentine's Day. And a lot of people don't realize that St. Valentine is actually the patron saint of epilepsy. And this is a quote that I found, St. Valentine, besides to such as does his power despise the following sickness sins and helps those the man helps the man to him the Christ. So this is a paper. You can actually get this paper and it talks about the saints of epilepsy. It's a very uh, fascinating paper. And there's my references. Um, you know, I'm afraid that the, this is a recorded session, so I won't have an opportunity to address any questions um, directly. So I apologize for that. And I appreciate your understanding just the way uh, kind of my schedule has worked. But, you know, just trying to think of, that was a lot of information. We just did a whirlwind tour through um, epilepsy and uh, the diagnosis of epilepsy the uh, treatment of epilepsy, uh, the non-pharmacologic interventions for epilepsy. But I will tell you, honestly, the best resource is going to be through the Epilepsy Foundation. And for those of you who are wanting to take a deep dive into some of the things that you can do from an empowerment standpoint, those self-management tools, as well as the Wellness Wheel, the Wellness Institute through the Epilepsy Foundation are fantastic places to start. So with that being said, I want to thank you for your gracious time, your attention, uh, your dedication to um, the epilepsy community, and uh, thank you again. Have a wonderful rest of the conference, and thank you to the Epilepsy Foundation of Colorado and Wyoming.